Hello and good afternoon. I hope everybody's having a great Halloween. Sorry this video is coming to you late, but I had to make sure that power wasn't going to go out and internet was stable and it took a couple of days. So i uh, going to cover real quickly what I would have covered in class on Thursday. So we're going to talk about Manifest Destiny, we're going to talk about Texas, and we're going to talk about immigration. These are all things going to happen in the 1840s, 1850s. So we're going to start with Manifest Destiny first, and here are two very famous American paintings. You can see everybody's pointing to the left, which would be the west, and you can see everybody moving to the west and looking at the west, and that on the bottom is Lady Liberty, who is going to the west. So that's what all that means there. Uh, manifest destiny is going to be a term used in the 1840s by Americans, and it's this idea that God said go west. It is the American destiny to spread civilization, spread democracy to the Native Americans of the West, whether they like it or not. Um, it's, Manifest Destiny is going to be used for the persecution of Native Americans. Manifest Destiny is going to be used to justify the idea of war with Mexico. And there are going to be many presidents who run for president on the idea of Manifest Destiny. You can see... William Henry Harrison, John Tyler, James K. Polk, just to name three of them. Manifest Destiny is also going to be helped along by the discovery of gold in California in 1848, and then the subsequent gold rush that started in 1849. So basically, Manifest Destiny, God said go west. It's the easiest way to remember it. Where are these people going? Well, there are three trails that are going to take them to the west coast. Uh, there's the Oregon Trail um, that takes them to Washington State and Oregon. Uh, it starts at Independence, Missouri, and it goes to the Willamette Valley of Oregon. And in 1843, a thousand pioneers go, and by the time the Oregon Trail runs its course, over 80,000 people have moved west on it. So many people went west on the Oregon Trail uh, number one, there's a famous game named after it. And number two, you can still see the wagon wheels in certain places out west because they've been preserved. The California Trail also started in Independence, Missouri, and it went to California. It was officially mapped out by John C. Fremont in 1843, <clears throat> excuse me, who worked for the Army Corps of Engineers. And by the time the California Trail runs its course, over 250,000 people have moved west on it. Then you have the Santa Fe Trail. It's the least famous of these three, but it's very important. It went from St. Louis to Santa Fe, which is now part of New Mexico, but it used to just be Mexico. It was the primary trade route between Mexico and the United States, and all the cattle that came from places like Oklahoma and Texas they would be moved to market along the Santa Fe Trail. The place these people was not going was known as the Great American Desert. Today we know it as the Great Plains. So we're talking about the Dakotas, the Kansas, Oklahoma, Nebraska region. Uh, they're places that are very flat. There are not a lot of trees, and it doesn't rain a lot there. You may have heard of you know the storms and the the tornadoes that hit Oklahoma and Nebraska and Kansas, but those are just seasonal. Uh, the summers, there's not a lot of rain there. Um, they were originally, this area was seen as un, unlivable, but it, that sense changed. But at the time, because it was viewed as unlivable, that's where most of the Native Americans were put because it was the least desirable, the least wanted area. You may have seen videos or movies based on the Old West with cowboys and Indians, shootouts, uh, people drinking in saloons. None of that is true. In fact, less than 5% of all the deaths that happen out West are the result of Native Americans. Uh, it's very unlikely for a Western style person or a wagon train to see a Native American. And if they did, more often than not, they were offered assistance in the form of food or water. Uh, what was real about the West, though, was death and disease. 
cholera, scarlet fever, um, just accidents, starvation, all of that was very real. And there are over 20,000 documented deaths of people moving west at this time. Most famous group moving west was the Donner Party. Uh, George Donner, he was a farmer, fairly wealthy farmer from southern Illinois. Uh, he and his family move out west, but the trip, the trip is doomed. They leave way too late. They get lost along the way. A surprise snowstorm hits them. They've taken more stuff than supplies. And things get so rough once they get lost that they end up eating each other. I'm not even kidding. They end up eating each other. Only half of the party is left alive when the rescuers find them because Bob and John have been eaten because they were the tastiest. Let's talk about Texas as well. Uh, American settlers are going to start moving to Texas in the 1820s. Uh, Texas was originally part of Mexico, and Mexico had just gotten its independence from Spain. And the Mexican government is going to invite settlers to come into Mexico with a couple of stipulations. Number one, no slaves allowed. Number two, you must become Catholic. And number two, you must pay an import tax on anything you bring or get from the United States. Everything is okay for a little while, but the American settlers start to bring in more and more stuff and start to smuggle more and more things, including slaves and including imported goods from the United States, that the tensions between the American settlers and the Mexican government, they just kind of get to a point of no return. March 6, 1836 is the Battle of the Alamo. Now, the story behind this is not quite the same one that you've heard. Uh, the Alamo was originally an old Spanish church or mission that was turned into a local government building. Uh, this local government building was taken over by the American settlers, and this was done by force. And then the Mexican government tries to take the building back from these, re from these rebels, if you will. And... 200 out of the 250 American settlers who have taken over this government building are killed in the attempt to get the Mexican government building back under Mexican control. Now, the story is going to change a little bit. The Mexican people, or the Mexican government, I should say, is going to be made to look like the bad guys, even though they really weren't. And the Alamo and the cry, remember the Alamo, are going to become a Texas rallying uh, movement or a Texas rallying cry. The Texans, or Texicans as the American settlers were called, are going to declare their independence from Mexico in 1836. They're going to declare Sam Houston as their leader, which is where Houston is named after. And then after about two months of fighting, the dictator of Mexico, uh, Santa Ana, is going to sign a treaty acknowledging the independence of Texas. Now, Texas, their real hope, they don't want to be an independent country. They want to become part of the United States. And they think, hey, we are no longer Mexican. We are now free, and the United States will welcome us with open arms. Well, in 1836, Texas representatives met with Andrew Jackson, and Andrew Jackson said, we don't want you because we're trying to avoid war and we're busy moving the, the Native Americans. The anti-slavery movement is starting to grow, and they don't want to add Texas because of all these slaves that have been brought into Texas, even though Mexico said no slaves. And then in 1837, the person who follows Andrew Jackson, if you remember, Martin Van Buren, he doesn't answer Texas either. So Texas is going to end up being an independent country for more than 10 years while they wait to join the United States. Finally, in 1845, Congress is going to vote to allow Texas to become part of the United States, and as worried, a war is going to break out between Mexico and the United States. Uh, President James K. Polk, he sends a negotiator to Mexico to try to talk about Texas and offer to buy California, but Mexico was in the middle of 
a war of their own, a civil war almost. And so there was no room for negotiations. Uh, when they finally do meet, there's a dispute over where the boundary is going to be. Now, the area between the Rio Grande and the, the other river, I can't say that name, uh, Nooses, Noises, not really sure how it's pronounced, uh, was really just empty empty land. Nobody really lived there. There's nothing fancy, but it became a sticking point because it made a big difference in how much territory was given up. When they couldn't solve that dispute, the Mexican-American War will officially break out on April 25th, 1846, and it goes a little less than two years. And Mexico does not do very well. Mexico is going to be forced to surrender when the U.S. Marines invade and take over Mexico City. The resulting Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo is going to give the United States most of the what is today the American Southwest. Uh, California, Nevada, Utah, New Mexico, and Arizona all become part of the United States thanks to the Mexican-American War and the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. Uh, there's one little part of the lower 48 states left that needs to become part of the U.S., and that's done in 1859 with the Gadsden Purchase. And that purchase is just a little itty-bitty southern part of New Mexico and Arizona away from Mexico. All right, immigration is something we have to talk about real briefly because this is when like the first big wave of immigration starts is the 1840s and 50s. Uh, it's really important to know, and this surprises some people, there's almost no immigration to the United States between the Revolutionary War and 1815. And that's because, well, number one, the Amer American Revolution has happened. As soon as it's over, then there's the French Revolution. As soon as that's over, then the the wars with Napoleon start. And then in the middle of all that, the U.S. War of 1812 happens and goes to 1814. So that whole period, the whole you know, 45, 50 years, is just war after war after war, and immigration stops. But as soon as things in Europe calm down, the immigration starts again. So you can see some numbers there. By 1850, um, in that decade between 1850 and 1860, there are over 3 million people who moved from Europe into the United States. Most of these immigrants go to New York City. Ellis Island, it's famous, but it's not there yet. Ellis Island's not set up until the 1880s. So you have like 40 ships a day arriving at on the docks, and people are just getting off and going wherever. Some of the people have nobody waiting for them. Others are met by family. Um, and 1855 is when the first official immigration office is set up, and that's Castle Garden in Brooklyn. And all they would do at Castle Garden is they would record the names of the people. They would uh, figure out what countries they're from and where they're going, and then they'd get a brief medical exam as well. So it was nothing in depth. Who were these immigrants? Well, there were some Irish. In fact, Irish made up the majority of foreign-born people in America. Uh, almost 50% of all foreign-born residents in the United States in the 1850s were, were Irish. Um, I can trace some of my ancestry back to Ireland, and uh, it's very likely that my relatives came to America in the 1850s, uh, at least according to Ancestry.com. Why? Well, it was because of the potato famine. It's not just a joke. It's the truth. The Irish used to get all of their nutrients from the potato. It was the most efficient thing they could grow. Well, in 1845, a disease struck the potatoes. 1846, the disease was worse, and millions of people died. Um, so if the Irish had to leave, the United States is where they came. Now, most of these Irish are poor. They don't have money to move, and they stay on the west, or on, I'm sorry, the east coast, which is why there are so many Irish Americans in places like Boston and New York City. And nearly 100% of these Irish are going to be Catholics, so the number of Catholics in this country start to rise. Germans, I can trace my ancestry back to Germany as well. Uh, you start to get a lot of German settlers in the 1840s and 1830s, and that's because there were a lot of revolutions that were attempted in Germany or what will become Germany, but most of them fail. 
Most famous are the revolutions of 1848. So by 1855, there are over 200,000 ethnic Germans in America. Most of them are well-educated, doctors, lawyers, bankers, things like that. And because they have more money, they can move west. And that's why places like Wisconsin, Milwaukee, Chicago, um, even even Michigan have high German populations is because they have the money to move west. Um, and they're about a third Catholic, so one out of every three Germans are coming over here Catholic. Uh, I personally am not Catholic, but my ancestors were. There are some other immigrant groups. Uh, you got the British. Uh, the British are coming here to help set up American industry. Uh, you've got Scandinavians, so people from places like uh, Norway and Sweden, Denmark. Uh, you have a lot of Scandinavians that are going to settle in Wisconsin, northern Illinois, and Minnesota. And um, there are entire, entire communities in those places that are Scandinavian. I have a lot of family in northern Illinois, southern Wisconsin. And the city of Rockford is one of the largest cities in Illinois. Rockford has a Swedish cemetery, they have a Swedish museum, they have a Swedish healthcare system, a Swedish church system, and even a Swedish education system there. And they have a lot of Swedish food, and this might sound weird, but Swedish food is really good. I'm just going to let you know that now. Uh, Chinese come to the West Coast in the 1850s as the mining operations take off in California because of the gold. More and more Chinese come to work in the, mine op the mining operations. And then when the transcontinental railroads are being built, uh, Irish work on the East Coast and Chinese work on the West Coast, and then they eventually meet somewhere in the middle. This is going to lead to something called xenophobia, which is the fear of outsiders or the fear of immigrants. There's this real fear of Catholicism and a lot of Protestant Americans thought that the Pope, who had a lot more power in the 1800s than he does today, would try to control the United States. Then we have something called the Know Nothing Party, which is developed, and the Know Nothing Party, they swear to never vote for a Catholic candidate, they swear to never vote for a foreign candidate. Now remember, a foreign candidate can run for office, they can hold office, they just cannot be the president or the vice president. Now eventually the Know Nothing Party will join together with some other small parties and become the Republican Party, but we'll talk about that in a week or two from now. Another part of the xenophobia is the fear of Marxism. Um, Karl Marx, who that's a picture of right there, along with a guy named Friedrich Engels, are going to develop the theory of communism. And there was this fear that Marxist communism would take hold in the United States, and people would lose a lot of money. Organized labor buys into this idea of workers of the world unite, and organized labor uh, forms, labor unions begin, and workers start demanding better pay for their working hours, um, better better vacation time, uh, they want better treatment, they want to work fewer hours, things like that. So Marxist ideas, even if the United States never becomes a Marxist or communist country, a lot of Marxist ideas are used today, such as, you know, um, if you have if you have benefits at work, that's born in Marxist ideology. So those are all the very, very um, different groups of immigrants. There's more than that. I can never cover them all. Um, now, just to make sure that you have watched this video all the way through, I do have to give you that secret word like I have in the past and give you a secret word quiz. Uh, so in honor of the news that Sean Connery died today on, on Halloween, and because I am such a big Sean Connery, James Bond fan, uh, I want you to give me the name of a James Bond movie. And that James Bond movie I want you to give me is Dr. No. 
Dr. No was the first James Bond movie, and for many, it is the best. So Dr. No is going to be your secret word for this class. All right. Um, hope everybody is safe, and we'll see you on Thursday. Bye-bye.